Look guys, um, this is the second installment of the review of the Skywalker EVE 2000. Um, it's taken a bit longer to get the second part of the review out because of you know, bad weather and traveling and all kinds of things that happened in between. Um, but uh, you know, this is the day before Christmas 2016 and we have a glorious day out here in Kansas. Um, very little wind, just a slight breeze, sunshine, um, it's about 10 degrees Celsius, so very pleasant day, um, especially for this time of year, it's amazing. So, I'm glad to be able to bring you the second installment here. Um, so, first thing, let me show you um, just a little overview of how I installed the autopilot. So, if I open it up here. so. What I did was I, I made a platform, just a, a wood platform, um, right there at the top of the fuselage. Um, and I installed the autopilot there. So this is one of those uh, Pixhawk knockoffs um, made by Olibro. Um, this is the second one of these that I'm using, and the first one worked flawlessly, so I'm hoping for the best on this one as well. Um, so, you know, the installation is very, very straightforward, really nothing to it. Um, you know, just make a platform. The only thing that, I, that, I, that might cause a problem, I don't know yet, is that the, um, the GPS with its magnetometer is right next to my flight controller. Um, so although I don't really expect it um, to be a big problem, there is a small chance that the proximity to the high tension wires, high, high voltage wires from the battery um, could cause some magnetic interference. So we'll see. If it does prove to be a problem, then I'll just take this out and, and mount it somewhere f further away, probably just on the top here. Um, apart from that, you know, it, everything is pretty straightforward. There's, there's really nothing to the installation because you have so much room. And um, the reason I, I made this platform and installed the autopilot there um, is because it leaves all the area at the back open. Um, so you have a, a big space back there that is close to the CG of the airplane for you know, later installment of cameras and, and other kinds of equipment that you might want to use. So that's the installation. Uh, you know, again, pretty straightforward. Because of all the space that you have available there, you know, everything installs really easily. You have a lot of options. Um, so with that, I'll get this thing you know, going. So I plan to set up a rectangular path um, just in an infinite loop. So the idea is to have nice long straight lines um, and then you can you know, tune the autopilot from there. So I'll show you how to do that. All right, let's go for it. In the initial setup, um, in terms of flight modes, what I have as flight modes are manual, fly-by-wire B, and then auto. And from each one of those flight modes, I can flip one switch, the same switch, and it will put, put the aircraft into return to launch. Also, for fail-safe, um, the fail-safe procedure will be to go into return to launch if radio contact is lost. Um, so the reason for doing it this way, um, these are basically the, the auto modes that I utilize when I do mapping. Um, and fly-by-wire B is a mode that is controlled by the autopilot, so it's, uh, um, it's although you, you, give, you can turn the aircraft and climb and, and dive and so on, um, it is actually a, a mode that is controlled by the autopilot, so you don't have correct, uh, direct control over the, um, over the aircraft. So the procedure that I typically use is I, I will take off in manual mode, then I'll put it into fly-by-wire B, and be ready to put it back into manual mode if something goes wrong. But if everything seems to work okay in fly-by-wire B, that indicates to me that everything associated with the autopilot is functioning normally, and then I can go into auto mode to put it on its mission. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is to create a flight plan. Um, so the flight plan is going to be rectangular in shape. 
with a couple of long legs. And the reason for doing it that way is that I want these long lines um, to simulate to simulate long lines that you will utilize when you do mapping. Um, so I want to make sure that the aircraft can follow a line fairly precisely. So in order to do that, I will um, start to insert uh, waypoints. I'll put the second one over there, and then a nice long line to get it in that area, and then back here. And then what I'll do is I'll put another one, um, even though I won't actually be using five waypoints, I'll, the, the plane should only follow these four waypoints. Um, I want there to be another one so that I can do a jump command, um, and the jump command is not the last one in the sequence, not the last command in the sequence. So I'll put another command in there, and then I'll go down here, and what I'll do is after waypoint four, I will add another one. So I highlight number four and I say add below. So now I can change it from a waypoint to a do jump. So now I say do jump, and I want it to go back to waypoint number one. Now, in terms of repetitions, you can set how many repetitions you want, but if you want an infinite loop, which is what I want in this case, then you make the number minus one. So what it will do now is it will fly, when you start auto, it will fly to waypoint one, then two, then three, then four, and then instead of going to five, it will do the jump back to one. And it will just continue to do that infinitely until you stop the sequence, or it will stop the auto or autopilot mode. Okay, so um, the other thing I just need to make sure of um, is what the altitude will be. My default altitude typically will be 100 meters, and this, this is indeed what it is. So um, another thing that I need to make sure of is the waypoint radius. For fixed wing, um, I like to have that at 25 to 30 meters, so this is a 25, so that is fine. All right, so with that, I can actually um, write the waypoints to the aircraft. So there you can see it's being uploaded to the aircraft. It's a very small uh, mission, so it doesn't take a long time. And what I do then is I right-click and say clear mission. This is just a, a, a procedure that ensures that you have the intended um, an auto file on the autopilot. So I clear it from here, and then what I do is I read waypoints. So when you use the read waypoints command, it will read whatever flight plan is on the aircraft. And um, there you can see it, it read back the, the plan that I had in mind. So let's check here. You have uh, five, uh, six commands, five waypoints, the first four will be utilized, and do jump back to one, um, and minus one for repetitions. Okay, so everything seems to be in order as far as that's concerned. So now I'm going to go back here and um, check the airplane uh, parameters to make sure that everything is as expected, is as normal. So, um, we have uh, 3D GPS, uh, which is what we need for automated flight. Um, the horizontal dissolution of position, the HDOP, is at 0 0.6. That is brilliant. That is great. Um, satellites number is 20. Now, this is something that you would not expect to see when you use uh, the, the real name brand Pixhawk from 3D Robotics. Um, so the Olibro system actually does a better job. So for in the same place, same type of uh, conditions, the, the, the name brand Pixhawk will get about uh, between 11 and 14 satellites typically. And the HDOP will be somewhere between 1.2 and 2.4. Um, so this HDOP value of 0 0.6 is really excellent. Um, 
Okay, so we have a battery voltage indicating a fully charged battery, 16.49 volts for a four cell. That's that's where you want it to be. I always check my amperage, make sure there is no, um, no unwanted amp draw. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2 is, is typical for, for a system like this as a resting amperage. And that is indicating that I have a fully charged battery. And I can't see any other indications of errors. Um, so the aircraft is positioned so that it's parallel to the runway there, like this, in this direction. So this, this gives me some idea that the, um, my uh, magnetometer on the aircraft is functioning normally. Okay, so you can see that the, the, the aircraft is at a slight angle there. Uh, but that's just as it's sitting on the ground. That is that is normal. All right. So as far as I can tell um, from all the electronic monitoring that I typically do, um, I don't see any problems. Um, so the only thing that I will do now is I will calibrate my um, airspeed system. So in order to do that, I'm just going to go to the aircraft, and I'm going to make sure that I that I protect my pitot tube from, from any kind of wind. So I'm going to put my hand around it like this. And while keeping my hand very still, I am going to say, do a pre-flight, do action. All right, and that calibrates the airspeed sensor. So you know, jumping between uh, around about 2.5 or so, that's that's fine. It's just because of you know the, the background electronic noise as well as some wind noise that's that's affecting the sensor there. But this is what you would expect on conditions like today. All right, so um, everything looks fine. Um, so the next step is going to be to actually fly this thing. Okay, so now that I'm in the air, um, I just confirm that my fly-by-wire um, B mode is working fine, and then I switch to the auto mode, and um, everything appeared to be fine. The, the aircraft did not behave in any abnormal way, and actually the um, the initial parameters that I used, which were the um, the aero mapper, the Skywalker aero mapper parameters that are part of Mission Planner. Um, just those initial parameters seem to work you know, almost perfectly. Um, the only thing that I ended up changing in terms of general flight parameters was the airspeed. So I changed that so that the airspeed would, would be at 14 meters per second. So at 14 meters per second, uh, the plane flies you know, very stably. Um, no problems at all. Um, the turn radius um, seemed to be appropriate, you know, at the parameters as, you know, using the defaults. So it was really easy, um, you know, almost no tuning required. The only thing that um, was a problem with the default parameters was uh, um, it was too sluggish to, to really um, stay on the line. So. So what happened was the plane would would over um, correct in a sense when it um, reached the waypoint, um, and it would pass the line, so the flight line, and then it would not be able to return back to the line. Um, so you can see there uh, that it it seems to fly in parallel to the to the line that it's supposed to follow. So that's something that I that I needed to adjust. 
and you do that by adjusting the L1 control. So there you can see the default is at 16 and first I'm just going to show you what happens if you make that larger. So what you should be doing is make it smaller but let me just show you what happens when you make it bigger. So first I'm going to change that to 18 and then I'm going to write the parameters and let's see what the effect of that is. So as you can see when you do that it actually makes the situation worse so the plane drifts off further from the desired line. So that is the wrong way for adjustment. So the next adjustment that I need to do is to go the other way. And what I ended up doing was to, to adjust this incrementally. And I'll speed up the video so that you can see the effect as I, as I was making the changes. But basically what you'll see is as you lower the value of the L1 control, um, the plane will get closer and closer to the desired line until eventually um, it was able to follow the line. So I ended up with a final value of 11. So the period of the L1 control was at 11. And that allowed the plane to fly fairly precisely on the line. Um, and it just seems to be very stable there. It, you know, it, I just let it go. It could do circle upon circle upon circle um, very reliably. Uh, no issues. There was a little bit of gusty wind that came up at times, um, but that didn't seem to affect the plane very much. So, as usual, landing was pretty straightforward. Um, I did a couple of flights um, on the day and, you know, landing, take off, everything in flight is, is pretty easy. Uh, everything happens slowly. It's a very forgiving plane to fly. Um, and actually something that uh, surprised me as I gained a, a bit more experience on the airframe is that the lack of power that initially bothered me um, doesn't seem to be as much of a problem anymore. I think it's just a matter of getting used to it um, and flying appropriately. But the rate of climb out and um, you know, the, the power in flight doesn't seem to, to be you know, too little for the intended purpose for sure. So um, I know that it bothered me a little bit and I, I made a point of that in the first part of this review. Um, but I think in hindsight uh, um, it is not such a big deal. Um, there is enough power for the purpose of the plane. So in conclusion, um, would I recommend the EF2000? Um, I'd say yes, uh, if you have the right kind of application. So if your applications include things like uh, long-range FPV where you want to fly you know, stably and slowly, then this could be a good choice. You can load it up with a lot of battery and have uh, very long extended flight times. Um, it's also a good option if you need to fly something like a large camera. Um, but it has limitations. Uh, I think you know one of the practical limitations might be that it will be limited in its usability and in rough conditions. So if you don't have a good runway or if you don't have uh, something like a, a catapult or a bungee launch system for the plane, um, then it might be a problem to deploy. Um, it's very easy to fly, very forgiving, so somebody who's a, who's a beginner pilot um, I think can do well with this plane. Um, it's uh, easy to assemble, very easy to build actually, it doesn't take a lot of time. So um, yeah, it's, I, I think it's a good plane for the right purpose. And thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.